right, Alex? I think I will get us started here because sure. we have got now almost 25 attendees. Welcome and good morning, everyone, to a presentation by Professor Alexander Dewan from the University of Osnabrück. Uh, we are absolutely delighted to have him present us here at ASU uh, this morning as part of our series co-sponsored by the German MC in Washington, D.C. and the German Cultural Center Treffpunkt. Up in, uh, up in Scottsdale, our series on the German elections, continuity and change amidst crisis um, in 2021. And this morning, we've got a great presentation on right-wing mobilization and voting in present day Germany by uh, Professor Dewan from Osnabrück. Now, Professor Dewan is a professor of comparative politics. His research focuses on the relationship between violent conflict, state building and development and has been published in many, many leading journals, international journals and political science. He's always been supported by uh, very prominent research bodies in Germany and overseas. And he does have some developing research on right-wing mobilization in the Weimar Republic and also in spillovers into contemporary Germany. So he's the perfect person to shed some light on these contemporary topics, looking at the uh, election in Germany uh, for the Bundestag this year. So welcome, Professor Dewan. Thank you very much for joining us and uh, take it away. Okay, thanks a lot. Thanks, uh, Henry, for the invitation and uh, uh, thanks a lot for having me. Uh, so I'm actually quite happy um, to have the opportunity to talk about um, present day right wing mobilization in Germany. So. Um, I would have to say that, that is, this is probably not at the core of my research, as, as Henry has just mentioned, uh, but it certainly is uh, at the heart of what concerns me as a citizen here in Germany. So I'm actually uh, quite happy uh, that I'll be able to, um, to share some thoughts um, and some data about present day right wing mobilization. So what I would want to do uh, essentially is to give you a broader descriptive overview on some recent trends and trends over the last couple of years and decades in terms of how right-wing mobilization has changed uh, within Germany. And then towards the end of the presentation, uh, I will uh, briefly sketch some uh, explanatory perspectives on these uh, trends and uh, patterns. Uh, and then also touching upon some of my ongoing research. Okay, so when you, when you hear uh, about right-wing mobilization in Germany, uh, probably pictures like those would uh, come to your minds. Uh, so from the 1930s and 1940s, massive popular support uh, for Adolf Hitler and his Nazi party and all of these massive atrocities uh, committed by the Nazi party in the context of the Holocaust and uh, World War II. Now, if we move forward a bit, uh, in time to the, let's say, 1990s uh, and 2000s, the, obviously the, the phase of right-wing uh, nationalism uh, and mobilization has changed substantially. So in the German media around the 1990s, you would most often see pictures like those, these archetypical neo-Nazi riots and demonstrations that uh, in the 1990s um, focused most prominently, as you can see here in, in one of these uh, pictures at, on the lower right end uh, on attacking uh, apartment buildings that were hosting asylum seekers, uh, so mainly arson attacks. So if we move still a bit uh, into the future, so essentially not into the future, into the present day, um, what would uh, then what we would see in terms of right mobilization is, I think, a bit more diverse than what we've seen in the and 1990s and early 2000s, and also, at least this is my personal opinion, uh, somewhat more worrisome. So what you see here on the uh, upper end, these, the pictures of these uh, three individuals are the core members of the so-called Nationalsozialistische Untergrund, NSU, National Socialist Underground, that carried out a number of xenophobic uh, attacks uh, and murders in between 2000 and 2007. So th this was actually the first real a uh, radical right terror cell uh, that we've seen uh, in Germany in the post-war period um, and kind of changed the, the character of right-wing violence that we've uh, experienced uh, over the past decades within Germany. On the left-hand uh, side, uh, these gentlemen that you see here are leading members of uh, the AfD, Alternative für Deutschland, Alternative for Germany, that I'm going to talk more about in a minute. This is the primary right-wing political party that we have 
in Germany at the moment. And just to, to put their thoughts into perspective, uh, the second one uh, from the right in this black suit with a white uh, rose is Björn Höcke. Uh, he's a leading member of the even more radical right uh, faction within the radical right uh, AfD. And in a very prominent uh, TV interview uh, a couple of years ago, uh, some of his uh, party follow, follow, um, fellow party members uh, were given some quotes from uh, two books, the books that he has written recently and Mein Kampf written by uh, Adolf Hitler. And his uh, fellow party members were asked to assign these quotes to either Björn Höcke's recent book or to Mein Kampf by Adolf Hitler, and none of them was able to do so because uh, in terms of, of what these uh, quotes contain, uh, they were so similar that even his close allies were not able to assign it to either his book or Adolf Hitler. So this, this basically shows you uh, where to locate uh, these individuals on a left to right political scale within Germany. And then the last uh, picture that you see here uh, on the right is uh, a picture taken in 2020 when a number of right-wing protesters uh, tried to storm at least the steps or even the building um, of the German parliament, uh, the Reichstag. And when you compare that directly to these pictures that I've shown you on the previous slide uh, of all of these uh, um, bald classical neo-Nazi protesters, of course, we see much more diversity here. And we see uh, a kind of a change uh, with the radical right trying to move their protest movements from the, from the fringes, from the borders of society into the center, mobilizing new segments uh, of the population. So um, these are two different dimensions of right-wing um, extremism that we see uh, within Germany and nowadays. So violence in the form of terrorism, voting support for AfD and mobilization in the form of protest. And this is what I would like to talk about in the uh, first part of this presentation. So for me, right wing extremism here is an attitude or behavior that is characterized by opposition towards equality and it has different dimensions like nationalism, anti-Semitism, um, uh, and so on. So I will go through these different dimensions of, um, of right-wing extremism uh, one by one uh, to show you some temporal trends and some uh, geographical patterns. And as I mentioned earlier, towards the end, I want to um, sketch some uh, potential explanations as to why we see these changes uh, uh, over time and these specific spatial patterns. Okay, let's start with uh, right-wing right voting um, and how support for right-wing parties evolved in the long run. So the figure that uh, I'm showing you here uh, goes long, uh, goes uh, back a long way to the 1870s uh, and then ends in 2013. So these are uh, the different colors represent different party families that represent different areas of the political spectrum in between left and right. And the most relevant for us here, so these vertical lines represent individual elections. So we can see in the very long term how support for different kinds of of um, political uh, parties and political programs evolved over time. So what we can see here, um, this period in between 19, uh, 1933 uh, and 1949, where no elections took place, uh, that was the uh, Nazi dictatorship. And we also see this, this massive gain of this extreme right-wing uh, support. Um, what I wanted to highlight here though, is that when we move from 1949 to 2013, we see very little change over time in terms of support for extreme right-wing parties. So they have remained rather constant in terms of their ability to mobilize popular support uh, in elections. Their individual spikes uh, maybe, but overall they've remained below 5%. Um, so in no election has radical right party been able to enter uh, the German national parliament. So as I mentioned earlier, this figure ends in 2013. Uh, and after 2013, a lot of things changed. And this is um, what I want to talk about now. So for most for most time, the main party that uh, has been responsible for these uh, developments of this blackish area that you've seen on the previous slide was the NPD, uh, National Democratic Party. Uh, it has been the most relevant right-wing party in Germany for a long period of time. It was founded in 1964. It's, it's a more or less a typical kind of right-wing extremist uh, party with strong references to uh, the, the Nazi regime. 
It had some electoral successes in the 1960s and uh, 2000s, but then uh, over the past a decade or so, uh, its general influence and ability to mobilize uh, people uh, has substantially declined. So you see here the logo and, and an election poster from this year's election, 2021. It says migration töted, migration kills. So uh, this is the kind of, of messages that the NPD is building on, not particularly sophisticated in political campaigning, but essentially these are the these classical kind of, of campaign messages. So what happened then? Why, why did the, the influence of the NPD uh, decline over time? Uh, it is mainly because a new uh, party uh, was founded, the already mentioned Alternative uh, for Deutschland, Alternative for Germany, AfD. It was founded in 2013. Uh, actually, the main program in 2013 when it was founded was focusing on criticizing uh, EU financial policy. So it was essentially an anti-EU uh, um, party program. It's only over time, as we will see in a minute, that the AfD became more and more classical populist right wing uh, with stronger radical right, even uh, extremist uh, elements within uh, the party. And it was the first far right party that was actually then able to enter the German national parliament. So you see here again uh, a poster for illustration. It says the Islam gehört nicht zu Deutschland. Islam does not belong to Germany. So it's a similar kind of, of anti-migration um, um, racist um, political program as we've seen in the NPD previously. So this is the development of the AfD uh, over time, which is actually, um, if it wouldn't be the AfD, quite impressive. So. These, these bluish dots that you see here are individual surveys that have been taken in between 2013 and 2020. Uh, and, the, and in these surveys, people are being asked if on Sunday we would have national elections, which party would you vote for? And the, this white line is the, the trend uh, over time. So we're starting uh, to the left, uh, as you can see on the upper end uh, of this figure, we're starting uh, to the left in 2013 when the party was newly uh, founded. And then it rapidly gained in influence, vote shares, political support increased massively um, in between 2013 and 2014. Uh, the AfD was then in 2014 able to enter the first parliament. It was the EU parliament. Uh, and then we see this little downturn. Uh, that happened in the following year, uh, 2015, that was mainly the result of a, an internal power struggle that was actually quite important for the subsequent development of the AfD. So in this internal power struggle, uh, different factions were competing uh, over control uh, of the party, the classical founding anti-EU, anti-European Union uh, part of the party and the more right-wing populist um, elements of the party, the latter uh, were able to prevail. And this, the end of this power struggle then coincided with what has been labeled a migration crisis in Germany. So a massive influx of asylum seekers in 2015, 2016, that we're also going to talk more about in a minute. So we see that the combination of this uh, change in political program as a consequence of this power struggle combined with this migration crisis led to a massive increase in support for uh, the AfD. We have then another period of internal power struggles, again, in between a more moderate, more realist, uh, right-wing conservative element of the party and an even more radical right uh, faction. Again, the latter uh, prevailed. And we see then uh, the most substantive success of the AfD yet in 2017. Uh, it entered the national parliament as the third largest uh, party, which um, is for the AfD a massive success, considering that no other right wing party has been able to, uh, to enter German parliament before in the post war period. And overall in Germany, uh, we see, have seen very little movement in terms of parties, new parties evolving and entering parliament. So this was a huge success for the, uh, for the uh, AfD. Now, this is uh, the development of a time ending in 2017. Now we're in uh, 2021. And uh, we'll have a look at 
some geographical patterns within Germany. So how do we see, uh, how does the distribution of support for the IFD look like uh, within Germany? Uh, on the maps that I'm showing you here, um, you have the results of the 2017 elections uh, on the community level on the left-hand side, and then on the right-hand side, the election results of uh, this year's election. So what is striking first is the massive, uh, essentially loss of the CDU, so um, a, a classical conservative Christian uh, party and, and uh, the gains of the socialist uh, SPD, social democrat SPD. What we can also see uh, at the same time in this uh, bluish color, this is the AfD, uh, that while the AfD overall has not been able to increase its vote share, uh, as compared to 2017, but it has been able to consolidate it whole, its hold on some areas in the eastern part of Germany. So you can see that there are actually some federal state like uh, Saxony that you see here um, uh, at, the, at the eastern, southern eastern uh, end uh, of the eastern part of Germany and uh, Thüringen right next to it to the west uh, are entirely uh, AfD essentially. And the AfD in, in, um, in these federal state is the strongest uh, party, much stronger even than SPD or um, the CDU. So um, we see the AfD electoral support for right-wing parties, especially uh, the AfD has increased tremendously over time. And we also see the special concentration of support primarily in some of the Eastern states. We're going to review um, and to view similar kinds of geographical patterns for other manifestations of right-wing mobilization in a minute. So I'm going before uh, turning to explanations about um, why potentially we see these specific patterns, I'm going to move uh, to another manifestation of right-wing extremism, and that is right-wing mobilization, specifically um, right-wing protests. So this is data uh, provided by the Ministry of Interior about the number of right-wing protests per year. So we're starting here to the left in 2005, and we're ending in the year 2020. So what is striking here, of course, is are these two massive spikes in 2015 and 2016 that again coincide with this migration crisis, the increase of um, uh, asylum applications uh, within Germany. And the specific movement that drove this increase in protest is the so-called patriotic Europeans against the Islamization of the Occident, PEGIDA. And uh, PEGIDA uh, has been mobilizing against the, the, the government's refugee policy and was actually quite successful in, in again, especially Eastern parts of Germany to, to bring tens of thousands of people uh, to the streets protesting Angela Merkel and her government uh, specifically. So what has changed in addition uh, to the magnitude of protest uh, over time is the framing of right-wing protest. This is something that I touched upon uh, earlier. This is not based on hard evidence. This is more based on my personal perception. Uh, and there's actually some news reports at least that would back this up. The change that I'm referring to here is uh, the attempt of the radical right uh, to somehow reframe uh, their political objectives in a way that they seem more acceptable to a broader audience. So whereas in the 1990s and 2000s, we have seen these, these classical kind of neo-Nazi protests that were limited to a specific segment of the population within the last decade or so, the radical right has made increasing attempts at broadening its support base. Based on reframing uh, their protests, reframing their slogans, uh, and trying to instrumentalize specific topics like COVID restrictions. Again, this is a picture of these, this attempted storm of the, of the German parliament. And you see here a combination of symbols. On the one hand, these flags that you see here in white, uh, red, and black refer to the German Reich prior to uh, Nazi rule. Uh, and uh, this is combined with, with specific uh, slogans referring to criticizing essentially uh, COVID-related uh, restrictions. So uh, there's been a lot of reports about how uh, the AfD and, and other right-wing organizations have been trying to essentially use uh, grievances related to these COVID restrictions to mobilize different parts of society that they haven't been able to, uh, to uh, access uh, previously. 
Then you have these kinds of protests. This is, has been labeled a commemoration event, commemoration for the victims of multiculturalism. This was the official label um, given to it by the IFD and the Pegida uh, that organized this specific march. And um, it was uh, organized in a way uh, explicitly to try to avoid any kind of um, public perceptions that these are classical Nazis organizing the protests. So prior to the protest, uh, members were asked to remain calm, uh, to not shout, to wear black suits, to, 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 uh, to give the impression that this is actually a more conservative kind of movement rather than extreme right wing. So um, the pictures that you see here, this commemoration event was related to uh, the victims of um, mainly Islamic terrorist attacks. So again, the attempt to somehow reframe uh, this, uh, this political program as, as, as an attempt at protecting a German society from some outside threat. Then we have uh, slogans like this one, wir sind das Volk, we are the citizens or we are the people. This has been the slogan that um, has mainly been used uh, during the peaceful resolution, revolution in the former German Democratic Republic that brought an end to the socialist uh, dictatorship in the eastern part uh, of Germany. And again, um, the right wing parties are trying to use to draw on these slogans and the feelings attached to it uh, to mobilize uh, people beyond pure right wing uh, messages. And then probably the most cynical um, attempts at uh, mobilizing um, specific segments of the population is this one uh, on this panel says, the größte Gefahr ist die schweigende Mehrheit, the greatest risk is the silent majority. This is a quote uh, that has been uh, attributed to Sophie Scholl, one of the leading figures of the resistance against the Nazi regime who was uh, eventually executed uh, by the Nazi regime. And we now have um, right-wing protesters using uh, quotes from her to try to paint themselves as legitimate resistance against some, um, some uh, autocratic regime imposing illegitimate uh, COVID restrictions on the population. So you can see um, in these framing attempts, again, the attempt to move into the center of society, to mobilize broader segments of the population, try to distance themselves from, from prior images of, of extreme right-wing mobilization within Germany. Now, again, we're looking at geographical patterns here, and we see um, what we've seen previously, a concentration of right-wing protests in some areas of Eastern Germany, especially, especially again, Saxony and uh, Thüringen, uh, and then, of course, a lot of protests happening in Berlin. This is the big uh, bubble to the northeast. And if we move to the table to the right and zoom in a bit more even uh, into individual locations, so these are the 15 locations within Germany that have seen the greatest numbers of right-wing protests in between 2013 and 2018. So when you go through the names of the federal state, again, you see Thüringen, Sachsen-Anhalt, Sachsen-Thüringen, Sachsen-Mecklenburg-Vorpommern, Thüringen, and so on. These are all the states that belong to the former uh, German Democratic Republic, these eastern states that you see here with one sole example, uh, with one uh, location in Bavaria. So again, in terms of right-wing mobilization in terms of right-wing protests, we see a certain development over time. Um, we see an increase in protests, especially 2015 and 2016. We see a change in framing attempts. And at the same time, similar to electoral support for right-wing parties, we see a strong geographic con concentration in eastern parts of the country. OK, let's um, have a look at the last a kind of element of, um, of right-wing extremism, and that is actual violence. I want to start with a, with a timeline uh, of events starting in the 1990s, um, describing what kinds of violence, right-wing violence, we've experienced in between the 1990s primarily and uh, 2015 here. So as mentioned earlier, we've seen a lot of arson attacks that were focusing on buildings that were housing asylum seekers in the 1990s, uh, then again 2003, 2004, um, then again in May 2015. In 2015, in total, one of the years with, with the strong um, influx of um, asylum seekers, a total of more than 1,000 attacks on refugee homes in only one year. 
At the same time, between 2000 and 2007, as mentioned earlier, we have these terrorist attacks conducted by the NSU. But what I want to highlight here is that most of this violence has actually been targeting uh, asylum seekers and refugees, arson attacks, riots, and so on. But the character of right-wing violence then changed uh, after 2015. So these are incidents of right-wing violence between 2015 and 2019. So we see here a knife attack on a, a politician in 2015, the assassination of another politician in the city of Kassel in 2019, and we have three mass shootings uh, and or attempted uh, massacres. So this is a different kind of nature of violence that we're seeing here. So this is not this kind of mob riot violence against refugee homes that we've seen previously. Uh, this is actual right-wing terrorism uh, increasing over the last couple of years. And this is something that prior to 2015, we have very rarely seen and or not seen at all in this magnitude uh, in post-war Germany. So things, uh, again, seem to change, especially after 2015. Looking specifically at last year, uh, the last year for which systematic data is available, 2020, uh, German, um, uh, the, the Ministry of Interior recorded a total of uh, 23 uh, extremist crimes that do not involve violence and roughly 1,000 extremist acts of violence. So these extremist crimes are at an all-time peak uh, in, in 20 years. So this led Interior Minister Seehofer, who actually on within the, the conservative uh, faction of uh, German politics is already rather to the right, um, led to this uh, rather famous quote, right-wing extremism is the greatest threat to security in our country uh, nowadays. Again, turning to, uh, to geographical patterns, we see the same pattern replicated all over the place. We see a certain degree of distribution of right-wing violence across the country, but again, concentration in federal states uh, in the East uh, in terms of acts, number of acts of violence per uh, 100,000 inhabitants. Okay, so these are, are a couple of, of trends and uh, geographical patterns that I wanted to highlight. Now I would like to move on to some uh, potential explanations of what we're seeing here in terms of temporal developments and in terms of, of um, spatial patterns. So of course, research on right-wing extremism in Germany um, is based on the same kinds of theoretical arguments that you see in other kinds of research that focus on other countries, other kinds of protests and other kinds of mobilization related to grievances, uh, resource mobilization and so on. So I don't want uh, don't want to uh, delve deeper here into these more general, uh, explanations. Uh, instead, because I'm focusing on Germany, I would like to focus on a couple of explanations that concentrate specifically on characteristics of Germany. Right? Uh, and to see if, to what extent, there may be something uh, specific in right-wing mobilization in Germany that may be different from patterns and determinants of mobilization in other contexts. So I want to start with, um, with this uh, migration crisis. Of course, uh, a number, not only Germany, a number of countries have uh, experienced uh, this inflow of uh, migrants in 2015 and 2016. But just to uh, illustrate the magnitude uh, in Germany, uh, you're seeing here on the left-hand side uh, a map of Europe uh, and then also including uh, the US and uh, Canada. And the size of the bubble indicates the number of the, the absolute number, not scaled by population, the absolute number of asylum seekers in the year 2016. Um, and you may be able to see, even though the map is pretty small, that the largest bubble is actually on Germany. Um, and it becomes more obvious to what extent this constituted a real kind of social economic shock, if you want, uh, to the country. Um, you can have a look at the figure to the right, where you can see that in 2009, 2010, 2011, um, we had a couple of maybe tens of thousands of uh, asylum seekers per year, and then it increased to uh, roughly 600,000 in only one year in 2016. So, of course, uh, we, a lot of people realized that there was something happening, something changing, um, creating um, among some segments of the population fears and frustrations. And one could argue that that was actually uh, what brought uh, the AfD, uh, a lot of 
success, but also a lot of participation in right-wing protest movements and maybe also motivated some of the right-wing violence that we've seen. Now, even though it seems like a plausible explanation when we zoom uh, into temporal developments uh, a bit more and compare the development of the support for the IFD on the one hand and the development of the registered refugees uh, on the other hand. So this is not asylum seekers. These are those that have actually been registered uh, within Germany. So we see a slightly different pattern here, also an increase in 2015, but in a strong decline related to more restricted migration policies within Germany. So now, in blue, the development of electoral support for the AfD, and in red, the development of the number of registered refugees uh, over time. Now, it seems for some part of this figure that there actually is this kind of correlation uh, over time in between the number of refugees and the increase uh, of support for the right-wing uh, AfD. But then from 2016 on, um, the two trends somehow diverge. Uh, we see a decreasing number of refugees, but still see an increase in, in electoral support for the AfD. So it seems that there's something else happening here. Uh, this is at least not, um, does not correspond to what we would expect based on a, on a very strong uh, correlation in between uh, people's support for right-wing uh, parties on the one hand and, um, and uh, refugees within Germany on the other hand. And this is confirmed when we zoom uh, into and have a look into some uh, geographical patterns. So on the two maps here to the left, you see what you've seen previously, a concentration of RFD electoral support in eastern regions of right wing crime in eastern regions. But then when we look at the proportion of foreigners, uh, we actually see that uh, in the eastern regions, we have the lowest shares of foreigners across all of Germany. And again, this is, does not correspond to the simple explanation that more refugees equals more support for right-wing uh, political parties or more participation in right-wing uh, protests. So, but this figure again may hint uh, at, at the fact that really there, there seems to be something specific about the eastern parts of Germany. Uh, right, so we see these these very strong spatial differences in between the eastern states and the rest of the country across all of the maps that I've shown to you uh, up until now. So this is the second potential explanation that I would want to focus on. So as you know, Germany was separated in between 1961 and 1989 into two political and social economic systems: a democratic western part of the country with a with an uh, with a classical uh, capitalist uh, economic system. And uh, on the Eastern part, uh, we have the former German Democratic Republic, socialist regime, uh, socialist um, economy. Now, uh, Germany is reunified in 1990. Uh, and one could argue that uh, either the legacies of the a dictatorship in the eastern parts of Germany or the process of reunification could explain the specific patterns that we've seen, the specific spatial patterns, explaining why we see substantially higher levels of support for right-wing parties in the east. Now, what makes this seem plausible is, is this still quite um, impressive and at the same time shocking figure that has been published by the Washington Post in 2014. So what you see here is all kinds of political and social economic outcomes uh, plotted um, across uh, German counties. And what you see in red, the small red line um, on these maps is the, is the Berlin Wall. But of course, these outcomes are measured in 2011, already 20 years after the fall of the war. But we still see that no matter what kind of social economic indicator you pick, you see this massive discontinuity along the border. And if you would repeat this exercise nowadays, uh, again, 10 years later, you would still end up producing the same kinds of results. So even though reunification was 30 years ago, Germany has not been able to align social levels of income, unemployment rates, um, and so on in between two part, the two parts of uh, Germany. And it's interesting because it seems random because there's so many different kinds of characteristics that really seem to vary in between these two uh, parts of the country, like the number of trailers of flu vaccinations and so on. So there seems to be something deep rooted that differs in between these two uh, parts of the country. And it seems plausible that 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 these patterns may also explain uh, why we see uh, this level of support uh, for right-wing parties in, in particular uh, these regions. Uh, I want to very briefly uh, present the results of a, of a very interesting study 
uh, a working paper, a very recent one, uh, that has conducted a survey experiment uh, in western parts of Germany and eastern parts of Germany, uh, a priming experiment. Uh, so a treatment group received this prime that you see here, uh, priming um, individuals to remember certain phases of uh, social economic, economic distress. And please think back to a situation in your life in which you had huge difficulties to make ends meet. For example, this can be the case if you cannot afford to go on vacation, if your car is broken, don't have money to fix it, if you're unexpectedly laid off, and so on and so on. So the treatment group received this prime and the control group received another kind of unrelated uh, prime and uh, now the author is comparing or, or investigating the effects uh, of this priming on different subpopulations. So on respondents in Western Germany and respondents in Eastern Germany and those that have actually experienced some kind of economic crisis and those that haven't. So I want to um, I uh, want to ask you to pay attention to the lower uh, right end of this figure. So what we see here uh, in Eastern Germany is that those individuals uh, that have actually experienced some kind of economic distress in the process of reunification, if those are primed uh, in terms of remembering what they felt back then uh, in the process of reunification, losing their jobs, entering from this protected socialist economic system, the, the more much more competitive uh, economic system uh, and labor market of um, the western part of Germany, we can actually see that this priming has an effect in terms of reducing uh, people's uh, satisfaction with uh, democracy. So the argument of this paper is that it's actually the process of reunification and this economic shock that a lot of people experienced in the eastern part of Germany, this feeling that, that they're being treated uh, as a second class citizen in the new unified Germany that still is still explains the frustration with the national government. And in the light of the fact that within the, the past 30 years, nothing much seems to have changed in terms of aligning uh, levels of income and unemployment in the East and the West, uh, it seems somewhat plausible that, that these kinds of frustrations still persist and still influence political behavior. I want to move uh, to a third and last kind of perspective, uh, explanatory perspective on, on white mobilization, and that goes back even more in the past. So it may be that some of the pictures that I've shown uh, to you earlier uh, are related in a way that experiences of the Nazi rule and World War II uh, are still influencing in the long run uh, patterns of support for uh, right-wing parties and participation in right-wing protests and uh, the extent of right-wing violence. So this is a bit closer to uh, my own research, uh, so I feel a bit more comfortable uh, here, so I'm also going to invest uh, a bit more time here. Uh, I'm going to start with a study uh, that I have not involved in. Uh, that's a study by Cantoni and others uh, published in 2019. Uh, and this uh, makes it seem plausible that these historical legacies uh, of Nazi rule and World War II still impact on political behavior. So what you see here on the x-axis is support for the NSDAP, the Nazi party in the last more or less free elections uh, in Germany. And then on the y-axis, uh, you see uh, the, the change in the vote share of the AfD as the AfD changed its political program from anti-EU to more classical uh, right wing. And you see this, this actually quite neat uh, positive correlation in between the two. So as the AfD became more right wing, it enjoyed massively more support in those areas that had already uh, voted uh, for the uh, AfD above average compared to other uh, counties in the 1930s. So the argument is here that somehow through processes of social socialization and intergenerational transmission, uh, specific norms of nationalism, support for right-wing political programs are continuing uh, to influence uh, politics in Germany nowadays. Now, what we have done, uh, what uh, Henry mentioned earlier, is we've gone back even a bit uh, further in time and uh, we're interested in the effects of the world wars on political behavior in Germany after the respective wars. So we've started with World War I and the effect of World War I, more specifically, uh, the effect of uh, the spatial distribution of World War I casualties within Germany on support 
uh, for the uh, NSDAP. So the argument here is that as civilians experienced death and loss of uh, family members and friends, uh, that this basically strengthened the demand side uh, of nationalism. Uh, and of course, we had the supply side in the NSDAP that spoke exactly to these kinds of sentiments of hatred and revenge. So we do find uh, in this paper um, a relatively strong effect, uh, a relatively pos strong positive correlation in between the death rate, so the magnitude of um, loss on a community level and the extent of um, electoral support for the NSDAP in the interwar period. So it seems plausible that similar kinds of processes may have uh, impacted on political behavior in Germany after World War II. And if we look, have a look at this is data that we've uh, collected recently and coded recently. So what we've done is we've went through uh, data on all right-wing protests that happened in between 2005 and 2020. And then we coded whether these uh, protests had made an explicit reference to some element of World War II. So oftentimes these references are um, referenced in terms of commemoration of the victims of allied aggressions uh, and the like. So commemoration of the victims of aerial bombings in uh, of some uh, cities uh, within Germany. And we don't see it a clear temporal trend here over time, but, but uh, overall, uh, it seems that that right wing movements still try to capitalize on experiences of the war to mobilize support. Uh, and this is a continuous phenomen phenomenon over time and thousands and thousands in total, we have 70,000 individuals that have participated in the past 10 years in these protests that make explicit references to World War II. So in the light of what we found on the effects of uh, World War I, it seems plausible that we may see similar kinds of long-term legacies of war experiences on right-wing voting and nationalism uh, nowadays. So we're not there yet. So this is what, uh, what we want to do next to try to investigate that more systematically. What we have done so far, we've focused on a different kind of violence uh, in the context of World War II. So here, um, right-wing movements have been trying to capitalize on on what they call aggression, allied aggression. But of course, it may be that other kinds of exposure to violence have also impacted on post-war political behavior. Um, so this is another project um, of a couple of colleagues of mine and myself. Um, what we're looking at here is the effects of German civilians' exposure to atrocities committed by the Germans themselves. So this is not uh, as in the case of Allied bombing, some kind of in-group, out-group uh, antagonism. This is Germans observing violence committed by Germans. And the question that we're asking here is, uh, does observing these atrocities affect uh, political behavior of these individuals that have been exposed to this kind of violence? So we're focusing here on a specific element of the Holocaust, the so-called death marches towards the end uh, of World War II as Allied forces were progressing primarily uh, here from the East, uh, the Germans, the Nazis were forced to evacuate concentration camps. And it has often been argued that a lot of uh, German civilians have not been able to, to witness any kinds of atrocities committed in these concentration camps previously because they were closed. And uh, if you haven't happened to live right next to one of these concentration camps, probably you haven't at least eyewitnessed these atrocities. But in the context of these uh, death marches, uh, thousands of, of uh, prisoners in these concentration camps were forced to march long distances through mainly Bavaria. So for the first time, a lot of these rural communities were exposed to, to these thousands of, of, uh, of prisoners seeing executions in the streets um, and so on. So they were directly exposed uh, to these atrocities. And we want to know if this led to some kind of distancing from uh, right wing and nationalist ideology. So what we did here is we uh, have coded the um, the trajectories of these death marches um, throughout Bavaria. So in red here, you see uh, the number of deaths, so the number of people that have been killed, executed uh, along the way per uh, community within uh, Bavaria. And 
uh, we're comparing uh, these communities uh, that have experienced um, or, or seen these death marches with those that haven't uh, to see if there's any kind of effect on, on post-World War and nationalist voting. So these are the results. These are the, uh, the coefficients representing the correlations in between uh, the number of death uh, per community in these death marches and, and a variety of different outcomes. So support for the conservative CSU, support for the social democrat SPD and turnout. And we don't see a lot uh, happening here. But when we look at support for national parties vote share, we actually see a substantive decrease in the immediate post-war period um, that persisted on a lower level um, uh, to the 1960s. So it seems that uh, this specific dimension of exposure to war and war experiences, again, in the longer term, had some kind of effect, if, of effect on political behavior, in this case, reducing support for uh, right-wing parties. So overall, uh, when it comes to these uh, historical explanations, I think um, that, of course, not everything is predetermined by history, but we do see that we may get a better understanding of what is happening nowadays in terms of specific patterns of right-wing mobilization if we take these historical legacies um, seriously. So uh, I'm coming to an end. So I have talked a lot about how right-wing mobilization has increased and how right-wing mobilization is every, everywhere and becoming more and more severe and serious. Um, so I, of course, I want to emphasize towards the end that still, um, even though, of course, this is of great concern, uh, we're still talking about a minority within Germany. So the AfD in the last election, um, in the last two elections, has been uh, moving in between uh, 10 and 15 uh, percent. Uh, so this still, luckily, is, is a minority of the German population. And uh, luckily, most often, still um, attempts at right-wing mobilization uh, look like this, with very few people attending. So this is an example of Osnabrück, where I am right now. So this is actually the city hall, which is not far from where I'm standing here right now. And then luckily, uh, anti-nationalist uh, protests uh, most oftentimes uh, look more like this. Uh, so in the end, uh, even though these developments are of concern, um, I, I, I still would want this uh, presentation to end on a more positive note. So thanks a lot for your uh, attention, and I'm looking forward to uh, discussing this and uh, to your question. Thanks. Thank you very much, Professor Dewan. That was a really fascinating talk, combining a lot of uh, sort of observations of contemporary events, also with some really interesting perspective research that you're doing. So I'm looking forward to hearing more about that research in the future. I would like to call on everyone to type in your questions into the Q&A. We already have a few, but let's get straight into them because we only have about 10 or maybe 15 minutes to deal with the questions. So. I'd like to ask a question from Luke McComber, who's a um, political science undergraduate major, and he's asking why the AFD and other right-wing anti-system parties have been more popular in East Germany than left-wing anti-system parties. Like, for example, there was, of course, the party that was the successor party to the communist uh, ruling party that had some success in East Germany at least in the 1990s. Why do you think that the swing has gone from left-wing anti-system party to right-wing anti-system party? Yeah, uh, that's a great question. Uh, I don't know, actually, right? So this is this is a question that is very hotly debated at the moment, because in the last elections, the, um, the left-wing party has lost even more support uh, in former core areas. Uh, of support. And there's a lot of ongoing discussion as to how exactly uh, left-wing parties have lost credibility among their core constituencies. So for some reason, uh, the, the left-wing parties have not been able to credibly convey the message that they're representing uh, the, the interest of those that have experienced these economic shocks and that feel as second-class uh, citizens. So for some reason, uh, the AfD has been able to take over uh, control over these debates and and to mobilize these constituencies. Um, so I'm not entirely sure uh, why exactly this is. Why um, the 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 right wing parties have been more successful in in mobilizing these uh, frustrations. I think that one reason may actually be this migration crisis um, because. It not because of the refugees themselves, but because it represented what a lot of people in eastern parts of Germany were frustrated about the feeling that they are treated, uh, that they're not treated with, with, 
with respect, right? That there are foreigners coming to Germany that are now receiving all kinds of social benefits while they're still lagging behind in terms of income and so on. So of course, uh, as a matter of, uh, of core elements of political programs, left-wing parties welcomed the governmental decisions to, to welcome uh, refugees, while uh, AfD and others criticized it heavily. And I think that this may have been a turning point where uh, the AfD was able to more credibly communicate that they're the advocate of these uh, frustrated uh, individuals, not only in Eastern parts, but across Germany. Yeah, it is a really interesting transition because the, the left wing party did have some success, I think, for a few years after the fall of the Berlin Wall, right? Exactly. Yeah. I have a, a series of questions here that I'm going to try and put into one. And I know this is a talk about Germany, but a lot of people are wondering about whether this is a transnational phenomenon. So I have uh, one question from uh, Hans Kulins, who's asking, isn't this a more broader European cultural pheno phenomenon of move towards the right? I have a question from David Jensen, who's asking whether uh, there's any association between Marine Le Pen success in France and the uh, success of the AFD and whether perhaps this uh, American uh, nationalist, Steve Bannon, who used to advise Donald Trump might at his transnational movement might have anything to do with that. And then I have another question about uh, the correlation between the election of Trump and the AFD shift the timing basically that these things seem to occur around the same time so i think it would be great if you could just speak a little bit about the transnational aspect of what's going on in um in germany or in east germany yeah, yeah. i think there's uh, thanks a lot for this question um so there's a lot of evidence and there's a couple of studies on germany specifically that have uh, that are based on qualitative analysis that have conducted a number of very interesting interviews with leading figures of right-wing movements within germany and also other countries and it's obvious from these, from these um, interviews that, of course, there's an increasing amount of transnational coordination across countries, uh, not only within Germany, of course, but Germany is actually among uh, those countries where uh, the, the right wing movements are actually um, the most interested seemingly in establishing these transnational contacts, uh, of course, because they're using the vehicle of the EU um, effectively for, for political mobilization and actually uh, entering parliament and coordinating. So, of course, things are moving in parallel. Uh, this is something that we can observe for sure. Uh, we see increasing support for uh, right wing uh, parties in a number of European countries alongside similar kinds of, of developments uh, in other countries. I'm not entirely sure towards all of, whether uh, all of these movements are actually, if we see this parallel movement, because they're all caused by the same kind of underlying uh, phenomena and processes, or whether they're actually influencing each other. Uh, I think this is beyond of what I can answer uh, here at this point. Um, so I do think that, of course, we see similar kinds of drivers of, of this success across countries. So I think it's, it's, it's very similar kinds of constituencies that are being mobilized by right-wing parties in Germany as uh, they are in France, for example, or as they are in, in the UK. Um, but at the same time, I do think that there are some specificities uh, across countries. Um, and I think uh, that some of the elements that I have been uh, pointing at here in this uh, presentation when it comes to Germany uh, may actually vary um, when we compare that uh, to other country contexts, right? So. Uh, I think the, the pure fact that we have a certain kind of legacy, a, a very heavy uh, legacy in terms of Nazi rule and World War II creates different kinds of, of mobilization uh, strategies than uh, as compared to other countries where different kinds of messages, framing attempts are being used. Uh, so I do think that, that as I said, things are moving in the same direction, but I'm not entirely sure uh, whether uh, the determinants of these movements are actually the same across countries. And maybe just one remark uh, regarding uh, Steve Bannon and and um, and uh, Trump's election. Uh, so it's actually um, quite fascinating and and a bit disturbing uh, to what extent uh, within Germany, uh, at some point in in these protests that we've seen within the last year, uh, you see on these uh, on these narratives in protests, you actually see a lot of references uh, references like uh, Donald Trump self 
help, save us from 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 our German government's dictatorship and something like this, right? So there's strong references uh, to the U.S. because a lot of uh, individuals within Germany feel uh, that we would need some figure like uh, Donald Trump within Germany to basically get rid, drain the swamp, right, uh, within Germany as supposedly he did uh, in the U.S. So this is of course a narrative that is being replicated in in German uh, protest movements. That's very interesting. I wasn't aware of that at all. We are kind of running out of time, Alex, but I'm going to let's do two more questions and we'll try and keep the responses brief. So the first is from David Soroki, a faculty member here in uh, the School of Politics and Global Studies. He's asking about the argument about the legacy from the uh, communist period. He says, how much of the East-West divide is due to the transition itself? How much is due to the uh, communist period and how much can you attribute to the pre-communist period? And also, given that there was a lot of movement of individuals from the East to the West uh, from and after the wall came down, but also, of course, from further East into East Germany after World War II, um, how much of these sorts of things can you attribute to individual level factors when the people may have been changed several times in these areas? Yeah, yeah. Yeah, thank you. That's a great question. Um, so I always wanted to uh, run a couple of regression discontinuity analysis using the discontinuity along the border, but on outcomes on pre pre separation outcomes, right? Because we would expect that if uh, if it was really due to the communist regime or the transition, um, then we wouldn't see any kind of discontinuities along the Berlin Wall for outcomes measured before the construction of the wall, right, or even before uh, World War II. Um, I think there's actually a couple of researchers that are working on this, and my understanding is that they found uh, that indeed we see similar kinds of discontinuities um, long before uh, the construction of the wall. So this, of course, strongly indicates uh, that we should be careful in terms of attributing too much explanatory power to the regime itself and, and to uh, to the transition phase. So, um, but I nonetheless think, so I found this, this, this recent paper that I've briefly presented very convincing because previously, of course, a lot of arguments have been made about socialization within a socialist regime and socialization within uh, a dictatorship and how that would affect political behavior. But personally, I haven't found much of these explanations particularly convincing because they don't really explain uh, the specific uh, support for uh, for right wing um, parties, and I think that this argument about frustrations related to the immediate transition phase and economic shocks that that a lot of individuals within the former East faced as they lost uh, their total economic security, right, having grown up in a in an economic system without any kind of of labor market competition, um, that this is something that that still persists in the minds. And in my personal opinion, I have lived in Berlin for quite some time uh, and and this ongoing frustration of this feeling that reunification didn't bring anything positive to the people because actually they felt much more secure uh, and um, economically secure uh, in the GDR is something that you see and hear all over the place so this is why I think that this argument makes a lot of sense even though I do agree that we have to be careful um, to not forget that there have been substantive um, regional disparities even before the construction of the wall. Yeah, you're, you're right. Uh, I also lived in Berlin for several years and it's striking the way that a lot of these perceptions and perceived grievances have persisted through now uh, 30 years, right? It's kind yeah, of a long yeah, time for yeah. these things to persist. I'm going to finish with by combining two questions from two of my students. One is Justin uh, Schwagers, who's taking my... Uh, class on democratization in Europe at the moment, and the other buyers, Lizette Cervantes, who's a graduate student in our department. And both of them are wondering about the future. So Lizette is wondering about Me too. Change, <laughs> changing <laughs> tactics of right-wing uh, parties, right-wing violent actors. And Justin is arguing, uh, asking about the best ways to combat these sorts of uh, mobilization, this sort of voting in the future. Do you uh, have any prospective thoughts about the success of the AFD electorally, the, the direction of this sort of mobilization, but perhaps especially um, violent mobilization is going to go. Yeah. 
Thanks. I think this is kind of the million dollar question at the moment, right? Because a lot of frustrations um, and uh, a lot of the mobilization attempts, as you have seen in some of these pictures, have heavily centered around the, the specific figure of Angela Merkel, right? The one uh, that um, that essentially is seen as the one that led all of the refugees in uh, and essentially provided all of these social benefits to the refugees and so on. So a lot of these grievances have been centering around her. So I'm extremely curious to see uh, what's going to happen with uh, as soon as we have the new government uh, in place, right? Um, of course, uh, it probably would have been even more interesting if we would have had another conservative uh, government with a, another uh, chancellor that potentially would have been able to channel some of these pre-existing grievances. Uh, I'm not entirely sure uh, what is going to happen. Um, what I'm sure about, though, is that this attempt uh, of the uh, AfD specifically and uh, right-wing movements in Germany more generally, this attempt that I mentioned to try to distance them more and more from the past and past strategies of right-wing mobilization is something that uh, I'm sure will continue. So nowadays you hear uh, leading really extreme far-right members of the AfD saying something like um, Nazis raus, a slogan uh, attributed usually to the left, right? Saying something like we want to get rid of, of the Nazis, right? Because they, they try to officially, explicitly try to uh, move themselves into the center. Um, and I think that, that this kind of strategy uh, is going to be something that, that we'll see even more uh, in the future. Um, how to combat the chances that the um are yeah. there any chances that these policies could be adopted by the mainstream parties perhaps by the mainstream conservative party as time goes on if the yeah. if the right wing radicals are trying to push them to the center so much that they could yeah. be in fact the right wing could sort of be eliminated by the conservative party simply taking these some of the their policies yeah. and yeah. approaches i think um i'm not entirely sure if 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 this is going to be successful i think uh, there's a couple of very interesting studies um that uh, exploit the, the um, basically the, the entry into parliament or not of right-wing parties, depending on some quotas in parliament, uh, to try to investigate the effects of, um, of right-wing parties entering parliament on the political positions of established conservative parties. So um, the argument would be here that conservative parties perceive of, of right-wing uh, parties as a threat and try to adapt, try to establish, uh, basically try to uh, reach some of the constituencies of these uh, right-wing parties. And I think that there's, that there's quite convincing evidence that this is happening, right? This is happening not only in Germany, this is happening in other Euro European countries as well. But I haven't seen a, a lot of evidence that this is successful, right? That this would be able to... Um, to reduce popular support uh, and win back uh, voters that, that conservative parties have lost uh, to, to right-wing parties. So there has been uh, this claim of one of the, of the um, candidates that wants to be the new uh, head of the CDU, uh, Angela Merkel's party, who said that if I'm going to be chancellor from one day to the other, I'm going to half support for the AfD, right? So this is exactly this argument because he's on the right end uh, of the political spectrum within uh, the CDU, and this is the argument that if they would adopt more conservative, classical conservative positions, that they could reduce support for the AfD. But um, he's not going to be chancellor, so we'll never know. Um, and um, so I, don't, I honestly don't know how, how this new coalition government uh, that, that leans to the left is going to affect right-wing mobilization. If it's going to uh, help it or not, um, I simply don't know. Well, although you don't have an effective crystal ball, Alex, I think uh, you've given us an excellent, excellent talk. So thank you very much on behalf of uh, me, the School of Politics and Global Studies, the School of Historical, Philosophical, Religious Studies, uh, and everyone at ASU. Thank you very much for a very interesting talk. Um, and thank you, everyone, for attending. We had really great attendance, really great questions. So yeah, thank thanks you a lot. Oxford for his help coordinating. Yeah, thank you so much for the invitation. And um, yeah, I, I wish you a, a nice continuation of this uh, fascinating lecture series. Thanks a lot. Thank you very much.